I want to thank the conference organizers for inviting us to do this session. I also want to acknowledge the huge contribution that has been made to the HIV vaccine field by many scientists, clinicians, and the community. We have decided to structure this plenary to be complementary to both the HIV vaccine and cure field, trying to learn from each other to make more catalytic steps to, end, to get to the end game. So I want to ask the question, can a vaccine strategy contribute to both prevention and cure? And can we learn from previous efficacy studies, non-human primate research, and neutralizing, anti and neutralizing antibody signs to see whether we can make biological interventions that can, can both be used for prevention and, th and therapeutic interventions? So what kind of immune responses are required for an effective vaccine? We need potent neutralizing antibodies, as seen from SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccines, the correlate between neutralizing antibody and, and protection. We need them to be broad, broadly reactive. We need our immune res responses to be persistent. And we need memory T cells that, just, that suppress viral replication. We also need immune responses that prevent viral escape. The rapid integration of HIV after acquisition and the inability for early therapy to interrupt this integration means that the goal of an HIV vaccine must be to prevent acquisition or eradicate recent infection. From, the, from studies coming from, from AMP and um, SARS-CoV-2, we see that it takes uh, around between 50 and 100 times more neutralizing antibody to inhibit HIV than it does to inhibit SARS-CoV-2. So, so starting off with the correlates of immune response from prior, from prior infections, we want to see whether this will be a useful barometer to measure future vaccine strategies. So we've looked at the RV144 study, HV10505, HV10702, and HV705, and you can see from the Kaplan-Meier plots that the only uh, vaccine that had was moder moderately efficacious was the RV4, RV144 tired trial. So important correlates identified in RV144 provide us a lens to evaluate HV10505, 702, and 705. And for this purpose, for the purpose of this talk, I will focus mainly on the interplay between CD4 and CD8 T cell responses in, relation, in relationship to both the breadth and magnitude of V12 antibody, antibody responses. So going on, moving forward, looking at HV10505, which was a, a VRC a DNA ad 5 heterologous prime boost, uh, the correlates of protection were a, um, a combination of high, high CD8 T cell polyfunctionality and an antibody response which was associated with protection. The, the figure on your right shows the um, envelope specific, specific CD8 T cell polyfunctionality and its role in protection. And the, and the table on your left shows the relationship between um, antibody responses and T cell responses and the role of it in protection. So very important, uh, the first time we see a nice correlate between CD8, T cell polyfunctionality and protection. Looking at um, RV144, we see that the V1, V2 IgG was found to be an immune correlate of risk in RV144. This correlate has been confirmed in studies in different labs using different assays and reagents. The studies that have, been, had been, that have been expanded have included cross-clade antigens, anti AE sequences to representing circulating strains, and a cross-reactivity score. So these studies, again, demonstrate that the breadth of V1, V2 immune response correlate with HIV infection. Also, importantly, not only do we need breadth, but this slide shows that the role of the levels or the magnitude of levels of IgG responses we need to induce protection. And this slide demonstrates the association between the magnitude or levels required for IgG to be useful in protection. This slide, um, this, this was a poster presentation um, in, at, at the IAS yesterday, and it looks at HV10702 and the immune correlates from a case control study. And again, shows the relationship between high antibody V1, V2 responses in combination with a polyfunctional CD4 T cell response to achieve protection from HIV. And so here we see the interplay of, of high um, IgG responses together with a polyfunctional CD4 T cell response to, to achieve protection from HIV. Also, and as a late breaker yesterday, 
we had Ivy Kenny that presented some of the correlates of the 705 or Imbricoda study. And this, uh, this, this slide I've taken from his talk shows again um, the, the breadth of the IgG3 V1, V2 um, uh, response as a possible inverse correlate of risk in the study. So my message from, this, from the correlates of protection studies is that three neutralizing HIV effects, uh, vaccine efficacy studies, RV144, 702, and 705, indicate that high teeters of V1, V2 antibody, um, antibodies may play a role in reducing HIV acquisition. We can't yet eliminate the, the V1, V2 hypothesis because neither 702 or HV10705 induced high enough teeters to confirm this correlator protection as identified in RV144. IgG3 IgG breadth was also a consistent correlate to decreased HIV risk in RV144, HV10505 and 705. In HV10505, the first efficacy trial that used the modality that elicited a significant prevalence of CD8 T cell responses suggested that, these, that those with high CD8 T cell responses after vaccination had reduced acquisition. So let's go on to non-human primate research. And I'm going to focus only on a particular um, uh, non-human primate study, and that is with the rhesus, um, rhesus CMV vaccine. I'm using the variant um, 681, which has some genomic rearrangements, which may be particular to the, the interesting aspects of this vaccine. And I will show you both replicating and attenuated rhesus CMV um, uh, studies using this vaccine. So in first, the first uh, slide I'll show you is around the replication or spread competent CMV vector um, using the 681 um, rhesus um, CMV. And this um, experiment was with four, four groups of monkeys um, looking at um, either two doses of the rhesus of the CMV or a dose of the CMV with a, an adeno to do, compared to a DNA with an adeno and also as compared to controls. And yeah, you can see um, in, both, um, in both group A and group B, the, um, the reduction in viral load in, um, in, um, in macaques that had um, been exposed to the CMV um, vector. Again, looking at the attenuated um, uh, rhesus macaque uh, CMV, you can also see that um, in this study, you get protection um, uh, from this after, after SIF challenge, and this manifests a rapid decline and ultimate clearance of the SIV um, from the macaques. So what is my message too? Is that it's possible that some um, CMV vectored um, we can use in, in, in human studies. In, this, in, this, in these two experiments, we saw that these monkeys were protected um, from, um, from SIV, and, and those who after, and those um, showed a rapid decline and ultimate clearance of SIV uh, from the blood after acute viremia, which may be an important tool for functional cure. We also saw that the protected animals were also clear of reservoirs of RNA and integrated DNA, and that the protection was associated with antigen-specific CDAT effector cells, recognizing epitopes presented by MHC class II and MAMO E molecules. So we can see that the non-human primates can be a powerful a tool and enable us to, um, to develop new modalities that can be advanced into humans. So moving on to the discussion around um, broadly neutralizing antibodies and, um, and um, vaccine strategies to induce neutralizing antibodies, I'll, I'll first start off with the AMP study. This was a collaboration between the HPTN and the HPTN and it occurred in two parts of the world, one in the Americas and one in Sub-Saharan Africa, looking at different modes of sexual acquisition. Now, this study um, investigated a, mono, a monoclonal antibody, VRCO1, and showed that in, um, in, in people with sensitive virus, this, this VRCO1 was, was protective. And this slide shows you the protected efficacy over time and looks at, at pooled VRC, uh, low dose 10 milligrams per kilo of VRC and 30 milligrams per kilo of VRC. The blue, the blue line shows sensitive virus and the um, orange and purple lines show um, uh, intermediate and more resistant virus. And what you can see for those people who had sens sensitive virus, the protective efficacy was between 60, eight, 60 to 80%, and this was, this was after two doses, and it was constant thereafter. But important, uh, the protective efficacy um, to more resistant viruses was close to zero at 80 weeks. Maybe we can move this, this uh, neutralizing antibody or monoclonal antibodies forward, and one of the areas we're looking on in South Africa is whether there's a role of um, body neutralizing antibodies to prevent or eliminate breast milk transmission. 
So we know with breast milk transmission, there's a very narrow genetic bottleneck of found viruses that causes breast milk transmission. And maybe we only need one or two BNABs to eliminate breast milk transmission. And so we are doing research in South Africa to see whether we need one or two and what are the best broadly neutralizing antibodies to, to move forward in the PMTC agenda. So what about whether broadly neutralizing antibodies have a role for antiviral control in HIV-infected people? And this study just looks at two powerful um, body neutralizing antibodies, BC, BBCN117 and 101074, in people, people with HIV who were recently infected. And so after receiving the infusion of the two monoclonal antibodies, three days afterwards, uh, there was a structured treatment interruption. And here you can see that, that those who received the body neutralizing antibodies were, were, were uh, remained off heart longer than those in the placebo, and also had, had tended to have more um, controlled viremia uh, post, um, post infusion as compared to placebo. So the third message that I'll give is that, that AMP demonstrates that broadly neutralizing antibodies are capable of preventing HIV infection and provide the future roadmap for vaccine development. The target neutralization, which is more than one to 200, in the TZMBL assay may be a useful correlate in future trials. AMP has demonstrated also that we need to make body neutralizing antibodies to more than one site, and neutralizing antibodies may have a functional, may have a role in functional cure. Vaccine approaches need to shift to eliciting antibodies shown to, to known conformational structures that elicit such antibodies. So moving on to the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about um, inducing um, HIV-specific neutralizing antibodies um, using active vaccination. And we've heard through the, the, the proceeds of this conference, um, the approaches looking at, look, that are epitode-based, we we'll look at lineage and germline targeting and look at stabilized trimers, and then look at different platforms like nanoparticles, viral electors, and mRNA. And there are three major approaches to broadly neutralizing antibody-based vaccine design. There's the lineage-based that um, is, is, is led by a Bart Haynes group, the germline targeting approach, which is mostly um, led by Leo, Leo Stomatatis and, and Bill Sheaf, and then the immunofocusing um, approach, which is basically lineage and germline agnostic, and we'll see some more work happening in those areas. An interesting and exciting um, feature of these um, is the use of the mRNA technology to do, to do this. And we've heard a little bit uh, around the, the conference around mRNA as a strategy for an HIV vaccine. And this um, study in non-human um, primates provides a, an idea of how we can use mRNA to advance um, body neutralizing antibodies and provides a proof of concept that we may be able to, to um, use um, Various envelope options. Here you can see the, there was an autologous envelope with, without the, the 276 glycan, and then the, the glycan was reconfigured, and then it was boosted by an, an ANC um, heterologous boost, and then also introduced a protein. And in this experiment, um, in non human primates, um, you can see that there was a 79% per exposure risk reduction in those who had these serious these series of um, immunogens given um, in, the, in, a, in an mRNA platform. Going forward, we anticipate using these kind of approaches, another 20 trials using a non, uh, an experimental medicine protocol approach. And um, already nine have been reviewed and are in full uh, protocol development, and we hope to move these along. And yeah, you can see the, the various strategies and uh, the, the various um, immunogens that we will be using in this experimental, um, uh, um, um, experimental trials. Very important then is to iterate fast, and that's where the mRNA platform will become important. So my message for is that experimental medicine will set the pace to evaluate the concept of body neutralizing antibody vaccine design. And we are investigating this also in HIV-exposed infants in the HV10135 study um, that, that, that comes from Bart Haynes' um, immunogen. So the use of this new technology, such as mRNA, may allow us to rapidly iterate this approach of body neutralizing antibody vaccine design, but we need speed to advance this concept, and that's where the beauty of the mRNA platform might, might come in. So what about the end game? So I've showed you data from clinical trials in non-human primates, and has emphasized the importance and the critical role of neutralizing antibodies for playing protection from infection. We've also seen that we probably need cocktails of monoclonal antibodies for both, for both prevention and a functional cure. 
and that mRNA platforms may be, um, of envelope proteins may be a useful, useful tool to use to iterate to induce BNA induction. But I'm going to say that um, um, we, we will need an HIV vaccine that requires a complex mix of immunogens um, as we need more than one targeted approach. And we need to combine these antibody approaches to, to also make sure we use um, approaches that elicit significant cellular and innate responses, and this is important to pursue together. So there are a lot of people I need to acknowledge, and I'd like to acknowledge the funders, the people that have been, have been, have been uh, there's been fidelity to, to making HIV vaccines. I want to acknowledge the enormous uh, resources that have been put in to get us this far. And I want to acknowledge the HVTN who, that has done incredible work in, in moving us forward, particularly Larry, and I want to also thank Georgia um, and Choi for, um, so for some in, insights on, on, this, on these slides. Also to thank um, Avi Vialari from the HV10135 who re enrolled the study in record, and the MRC Amina as well. But also the um, study teams of 505, 702, and, and 705, um, and everybody involved in the HVTN, our colleagues at DAIDS, all the site staff, our global cab, and our participants who participate at a global level in these clinical trials. Thank you very much.